Welcome to another edition of Real Estate Wealth Coaching. Uh, this video today, I am joined by Aaron Chapman. Aaron, thanks for joining me today. Good to see you, man, especially in this environment because uh, we haven't done it this way before. We haven't. And uh, I will say to the people watching, uh, Aaron right now is in his cabin in the Ozarks and your backdrop is way cooler than mine. It, yeah, I'll have to admit, I don't give a damn what the backdrop is. This one to me is the coolest I've been in. I just love coming out here, spending the time. I can concentrate way better here than anywhere else. There's something about this place. Yeah, there's just something about just getting away from the office and, you know, being in the cabin in the mountains uh, of Missouri, right? Yep, and still just working. I mean, I haven't slowed down. In fact, I work more here than I do at the office at, or at home. And it feels like it doesn't feel much like work when you're in this environment. There's just something cool about it. Something to be said about being in this type of environment. Absolutely. Well, Aaron, before we get going on our talk today, um, for everybody who's watching, uh, get on over to the Real Estate Wealth Coaching uh, YouTube page. If you like our video content, make sure you click the like, subscribe button. If you like this video, leave a comment at the end. Uh, also, if you're kind of new to real estate investing, uh, whether it be wholesaling or you want to do fix and flips, get over to realestatewealthcoaching.com. You can sign up for some free training and see if it's something that might fit for you. So with that being said, Aaron, uh, I'm excited. Uh, you know, I was, I was looking at an interview that you and I did, and it's crazy when I was listening to it this morning and looking at the date. That was 2016, and it doesn't feel like it was wow. that long ago. Yeah, because I remember when we did it, and it seems – Maybe a year, year and a half ago at best. I know. But 2016, that's coming up on four years, man. It's ridiculous. Wow. What is that, a Miller Lite? No, it was, this is this, like a, <laughs> a sparkling, what do you call it? It's a grapefruit sparkling water thing called Spindrift. It's some oh, a healthier good. one, I guess. I don't know, but it's awesome. Gotcha. You know, I'm a, this one's my favorite one of all those little, I, li I like those soda waters. I can't just sit here and drink something out of a bottle. Sure. Oh, so, so for whoever's watching, Aaron Chapman is a mortgage lender with Security National Mortgage. He's located in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and before we get into what you do uh, from the professional side, uh, maybe tell, tell us a little bit about your background, maybe what you did before you got into a real estate and lending. So the... The, the, I guess before that is I grew up on a, a cattle ranch, at least my high school years. Uh, and we were you know, running about 500 head of cattle a year. And uh, from then there, I left high school early because um, I didn't like the college classes I was taking when I was a senior. So I left high school, went to, uh, to Wyoming, worked in the oil fields of Wyoming, then into running heavy equipment, driving truck, worked in the mines in northern New Mexico. And they start shutting down that project. And I had to come back to Arizona to find a job. I had a wife and an infant son at the time. And I couldn't find a job to save my life, man. And that, there was a day that I, I finally broke down to go to a landscape company to get a $10 an hour truck driving job just to haul landscape rock. They shot me down because overqualified. Even though I was young, I'd done all those things. Like, there's no way you're going to be satisfied just driving a truck for us. So I drove away from there pretty beat up, man. I felt really, really bad about me. As I'm driving away from there to go to a grocery store to get diapers for my infant son, you know, we had, I needed a, a coupon to get it because I didn't have any money to get diapers. So I had this coupon my wife had gotten her hands on. And on my way there, my gas light comes on in my truck. And I had this little Isuzu pickup. So I went over to the grocery store. I had a gas station outside of it, pulled up to a pump, ran my debit card. I got a decline. So from there, I started rifling through my vehicle to find change. I started walking that parking lot for a couple hours. I found enough change to get two gallons of gas. That was back when it was like 80 some cents a gallon, right? Mm -hmm. Went into the, if it was today, man, I'd been out there for like a day to try and find <laughs> change to get that $3 a gallon. Yeah. So you know, thank God for that. And so I went into the grocery store, got the corresponding diapers with the match the coupon. I'm walking out of the store. I go face to face with a guy uh, who used to do all the scheduling and dispatch work at a company I, I dug swimming pools four years before. He asked me how things were and I explained my situation. He had a gift certificate to Red Lobster. He took me and my wife out to dinner, I think the following night. That's as I recall it. And that's where he introduced me to the mortgage industry. He gave me a, a business card for a mortgage broker, the branch manager, suggested I go talk to him. So I cut a foot off of my hair, cleaned up, um, found the cleanest clothes I could. How old were you at the time? I could and went over there. 
23 years old. Okay. So then I went into this office and they put me on as a telemarketer that weekend. Um, and then my mom even, you know, bought me some, some polos and shit that you wear to be a mortgage guy. And that's how I started out. And it was, um, after getting about 10 leads generated as a telemarketer, I asked them to let me work the leads and they gave me another, uh, introduced me another LO named Greg, who was my trainer. And, uh, that's how I learned it back in 1997. So basically because of, because someone generous enough saw something and you to give you a break, they gave you an opportunity. Basically, yeah. I mean, it was not only the opportunity that he gave me, but also just circumstance of life beating me to the point that I would try something different. Because there was no way a person like myself before, uh, before just being knocked to the bottom, I have considered anything outside of you know, using my back to bread my table. That's how I've been raised. I was raised, uh, my, my dad was a miner uh, as I was uh, growing up. He ran heavy equipment. We did the ranching thing. He had a partner on that, and that went to pieces. And I was actually working in the mines with him. How? Um, and so he, with that? No, I was gonna, I was just gonna say real quick when you when you when you started doing the telemarketing and you started asking to work some of these leads on your own, how did it go for you? It was hard. It was real hard. Um, because you know all they really taught me was here. Here's how you fill out a loan application. That was back when there were triplicates. You get on the phone, you talk to the person, fill out the information, you run kind of a quasi prequal. And I didn't understand the extent of what it took to get a person through the process. I was just taking it step by step. And so after we get to a certain step, I'm like, wow, does that mean we're good? And he says, yeah, we're good to go. So I turn it all in, but then it's time to go get more paperwork, more paperwork. I'm like, what happened to good to go? Well, it turns out their version of good to go and my version of good to go is two different things. So it, I started finding the toughest part was understanding the amount of time and hours and energy you had to put in just to get paid. I remember I would go months working 60 hour weeks and not get a single dime, not make a single dime in that world. I remember going in on my very first year, it was 2000, that was 2007. I started 2008. I went into the office on Christmas freaking day to sit with this guy and his son who lived together. His wife had died years back. And so his son was, you know, probably in his late thirties and this guy was in his sixties and they wanted to meet Christmas day because they didn't have any family to do anything with. So they demanded I meet them at the office. And I thought we had a deal done. I locked the rate, started pushing it through, got the closing docs, the title and the title company called me the day of closing saying, Hey, um, he already signed another set of docs and went home. Like, what do you mean another set of docs? So I called the borrower and he said, yeah, this other guy offered a better rate. I'm like, well, what rate? It was an eighth of a percent different. I'm like, well, did that guy go in on Christmas Day? And that was my only closing. So that was my only way to bread my table. And I was counting on that and it was gone. Mm. So it was real frustrating. It's a real, real tough business to break into. You got to have, you, gotta, you literally have to have alligator blood to, to be able to continue to do this in that type of environment, and stick with it, especially when that was the only way we fed our family. Now, when so, you, and then, you know, you get, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to, I was just thinking like, when you start, when you started with these mortgages, at the time, your 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 clients that you were working with were, I would say, what, a hundred percent owner occupant retail buyers, correct? Owner occupied refi, because that's what the broker was advertising for. He had advertised in the paper, advertised, you know, first guy in Arizona history to be able to put a rate on a billboard. He had this really cool idea of printing our information on a sticky note and have it put into the newspapers. And so people take the sticky note and put it on their fridge and they call in. And if you are present at the office, you just take the inbound calls. And that's how we did it. If we had telemarketers, they do outbound calls. And you just grabbed them and you sorted through them and tried to sell them on, you had the best rate. And that's all we sold us who had the best rate. That's all you had to compare to, right? And it was tough. It was real tough. It was definitely a, um, a, a market of sharks. There's no two ways about it. Now, when did your business... It, it, it's kind of like two questions I'm asking in one here. When did you start working with investors and when did you start getting into investing in yourself? When did that start to transition for you? That happened in the early 2000s. So I went from broker shop to little bank to larger banking institution and then on to countrywide. And when I came into Countrywide, it got to the point where I was, they, they were having a hard time competing with me 
in a condominium project where I found making a good relationship with the salespeople at the condominium project was where I really got my business from. I wasn't cheaper. I wasn't faster. I wasn't sexier than countrywide. They were kicking my butt everywhere, but the relationship. So what they did, they just decided to hire me. Well, I made myself out to be bigger and badder than I really was. I had this team. I had had to go around and convince other loan officers to come with me. And I came in force with these people and I negotiated a hell of a deal with them. I was still very young, but I was like, man, I thought I was powerful. They brought me on as the first sales manager in countrywide history. I started up a satellite branch for this other branch. The corporate guys called it the frat house because it was me and like eight of the guys. And believe me, we were goofing off like crazy. We were doing well, closing $12 million a month in business. It was awesome. And that's when the real estate investors started really coming into Arizona looking at appreciation. My mother was a realtor and still is. Does a phenomenal job with real estate in Arizona. So we were bringing in people from California, from all over the place to look at Arizona real estate. We were renting limousines. We were just, it was, it was awesome. We were doing tons of business. And then I was, had this team that was working with me and we were cranking out uh, probably the top five, uh, probably top three guys in the region, in the top hundred in the company. You know, country was a massive company and we did really, really well. And then um, I started getting involved in buying a rental real estate at the time because I found that I could buy it and then I could flip it in two, three months and make this massive profit because the appreciation was ridiculous at that time. I thought I was winning because I didn't know that this market didn't make sense. I didn't know that because I just came out of the mind like four years before. What did I know about the market? I knew nothing. All I knew is somebody said, if you make it five years in this industry, that's going to be your floor for your income. It's only up from there. My fifth year was stupid income. I'm like, that's my floor. Holy hell, Bill Gates, you better get the hell out of the way because I'm going to be taking over your crap. Right? That's how I felt. And I got really cocky. So I started buying investment real estate and I was flipping this stuff. I ended up putting myself in a really bad spot. And then August 8th of 2008 came. Everything was still working for me even in 08. I still was closing at least 20 trans- you know, 15 to 20 transactions a month. My real estate was doing okay. It wasn't awesome, but I had enough income coming in to bridge the, the shortage on everything. And I was doing okay. Then I got in a motorcycle accident that day, August 8th of 2008 at 12.24 in the afternoon. I woke up that night in the hospital, shattered legs, pretty bad shape. I already had one surgery and I was destined for another four or five. And when I came out of that, the business was obliterated. My real estate was obliterated. I had to wheel into a wheelchair to the title companies and sign away on these short sales. I was dealing with foreclosures. Everything was completely trashed. In fact, my memory Half a part of it was wiped. It would only last three minutes. So a lot of things happened because of that, which was actually a, a, a divine blessing as far as I'm concerned. Man, that's so it's, it's crazy how overnight you went from just rocking it with mortgages, real estate investor to essentially you're paralyzed in a wheelchair for about a year. Yeah. I mean, I was 30, 33 years old. And I had a, what, on paper a network of like 5 million. Um, when I, when I rolled out, so check picture this going into the, into the, the, uh, the accident, I was 190 pounds, seven to 8% body fat. I was marathoning. I was climbing. I was, uh, running trails all the time, just climbing every mountain I could find in the continental U S with my buddy. And then I rolled out, you know, you know, like I said, worth 5 million on paper. I rolled out of there worth negative on paper. Um, I was in, I couldn't walk and I was a hundred like 156 pounds. I'm six foot one. So you go from 190 to 156, you can imagine what that looked like. So there's a bone bag sitting in a, in a wheelchair, not even a, not even a sliver of the man I was before physically or mentally because of my, you know, because of the damage to my memory. And then of course, financially, it was completely obliterated. And I had to crawl back from that. And it was, is a person really gets to understand a lot more about themselves when the noise of the world is turned down and you only have you to talk to. Um, you start realizing the people who really care about you and who really don't. You get to realize also that the only way you're going to advance from that is you. I don't care how much my wife loves me, my kids love me, my dad loves me, my mom loves me. They can't make me get up out of that bed and walk. They can't get me to move forward in, in, in my life again and become something. I can lay there because I had a great excuse or I can get up my ass and move. And I was alone in that. And I know they were there by my side. I, I'm not saying that they weren't. Man, I was 100% dependent upon other people. But I had to move myself from that stationary position. And it was tough, but you learn a hell of a lot about you. 
I bet. So, so basically that whole net, like you mentioned, that whole next, at least a minimum of 12 months was rough. I mean, you're liquidating just like everything you said. Yeah. And then you have to essentially start your recovery process, not just physically, but mentally. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming obviously you had to get back into the, to the workforce here soon, correct? It was about, about, I think it's six or eight months. So I had a uh, short-term disability that kicked in and helped out. But as if, as it was, we were coming off that, I had to get back out in the game. There was nobody left in the game, but two people, you know, my mom and this gal named Carolyn, the Caldwell banker. And they were very, very gracious to me. And I, I can't, can't say enough about Carolyn when she would call up and refer somebody over to me. She'd call immediately back and say, Hey, did you write that down? I'm like, write what down? I, I had a memory that was three minutes long. And so she would tell me, go grab your pen, grab your paper. She would walk me through that process and make me take notes and read them back to her. She was very, very patient with me. And that helped me regenerate my memory was how to, I started keeping a notepad with me everywhere I went. It just seemed to be natural in my hand. And my mom did the exact same thing. They were extremely kind to me in that respect because their business was on the line. But they took the extra couple minutes on every call to walk me through it. Call me back, make sure I wrote it down. I was able to get my memory back over about probably it was about a year or so to really get to where it worked on its own. I didn't need a pad and pen for everything. It still sucks. I mean, it's not an awesome memory, but I can function with it now uh, get, much better than I did before. Now you get back into the workforce and the market has changed. I mean, we're, we're the, the crash is kind of going through its effect. Uh, a lot of things are changing in the lending world. How did that affect your business? I got back into very, very late 2009. Um, and yes, it was, it was completely obliterated. So there was those few that were doing that, but that's when the turnkey investor started working their way into Arizona. And while I was, I was, went back to countrywide, which is actually bank of America. And that's like serving time for a crime you didn't commit. Well, as I'm there, I got a client who was wanting to buy a FHA flip. Well, at the time, you know, bank of America will not do a loan uh, for an FHA buyer unless they, the sellers own it for 90 days. And I was on my way out because I was not going to stay with this company. I went to another organization called Prime Lending. And um, one of the other people in the branch says, hey, I have, I have an FHA flip too. Here, why don't you take it with you? So I went to Prime Lending. They said they can do it. So I called the seller up, said, I've got your, these, these deals. I'm going to start getting it processed. They said, well, can you do an FHA flip? I said, yes, I can. They said, well, every loan officer says that. And we have yet to see one not tell us to rewrite the contract in 90 days. So we'll believe it when we see it. We closed those deals in three weeks. The CEO of that company called me up and said, would like you to come to my office. I went to the office. I met with the entire board. They said, what do we got to do to promote you to be sure that everybody goes through you for a prequal going forward? Because we have fought that battle all the time, and you're the only one that delivered on what he said he would do. So we started collaborating on how to do that. And then, you know, big, big turnkey groups started coming into Arizona. And they were doing rehabs and selling them to investors. And I started doing a ton of deals in Arizona. Then they went to Indiana. Then they went to Memphis, where you're at. Then they went over to Texas, then into Florida, and they started just branching out. I started getting to know more and more and more people as the, those, those few buyers, that handful of 100 buyers, started just covering the country. Now it went from me doing loans in just one state to 25 states. You know, doing instead of, you know, you know, Memphis, Tennessee popping up on my radar and my company digging in and fighting with me to try. I told my need a license in Tennessee that said that this does, makes no sense. That's not going to be a good market for us. I went ahead and did it anyway. I forced the issue without permission. So we did it. And now I do 200 transactions a year in Memphis alone. You know, and that was a different company. The one I have now, Security National, they backed me like you wouldn't believe. And that's, and that's it's been an amazing wanna, last year with I wanna them. Ask you a little, that's what I want to ask you just a little bit because um you're with the, the company that you're with now is security national mortgage and you've been with them I, i'm gonna go out on a limb here and say 2013 2014 uh, 15 okay 2015 april 2015 okay. april 2015 so i went to came to work here and you obviously what, what would you say the percentage of your business right now uh are investors 99.9 percent .9%, man i mean it, it got to the point where i don't if i'm doing an owner occupied deal it's for one of my investors yeah it is very rare that i have a realtor send me a deal any longer just because we just we don't market that i don't target that i i just i found that it's better i really enjoy the real estate investor i really enjoy working with the turnkey providers i enjoy the people who are selling to those who are buying investments because it's a whole different conversation there's a whole different reason to do the deal 
And investors are doing it because they're going to generate revenue. They're doing it because they're providing housing. They're doing it because they're building their future. The person buying a house to live in, nine times out of 10, is trying to buy more than they can afford. Again, we're back into that crap again. And they, they don't hardly qualify for what they want. And then you got to deal with their agent who has expectations for something that, quite frankly, they don't understand enough about to get the, as, as pushy as some can be. They don't understand enough about the financing piece to understand how complicated it is now. Sure. I have 16 staff members to do what I do. It's that complicated that we need to build it like Chipotle. I have to have a person doing tortilla. I need there's a person doing beans and rice, one doing meats, one doing salsas. And the only difference between us and them, we don't have a stingy person with the guac. You know, we, we have a person will do it, but they're not going to upsell you and then knock half of it off the spoon. But I have different people doing the same thing over and over and over again because it's too damn complicated for one person to try and catch it all. Sure. Now, obviously, you all operate in multiple states, correct? Correct. And I'm also going to step out on a limb here and say that it's probably a higher percentage of the people that you make loans to are doing a majority of conventional financing where they're putting 20 to 25 percent down, correct? That's, I would say, all of my business. I mean, it's it's all conventional. I don't do any. I don't do any commercial. I don't do. I do. Sure. A, we do have an internal thing, so I'll do probably ten a year for people that that are doing the the stated income sign kind of thing or no income verification kind of thing. But it's very rare. Now, what I want to touch on a little bit is a. Uh, it's it's really a it's a popular subject. I know you know what I'm going to talk about. Some people refer to it as the Burr strategy, the Burr method. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, right? Yep. Yeah, it's about probably 30% of my business. Yeah. Just so you know what that is, I just did 723 transactions last year. So it's a pretty significant percentage of a uh, significant number of deals. Correct. So for somebody who's watching and they don't know what I'm talking about, the Burr strategy, it stands for buy, renovate, refinance, rent, repeat, something along that lines of orders. Now, we never used to call it that back in the day. Uh, this is the exact method that I've used to purchase essentially all 30 single family homes that I own and it's, I'll still continue to do it uh, that exact same way. But um, what I think is important for people to understand is that when you do this method, you know, there's really kind of two ways that you do it. You either purchase cash yourself. So you got the cash to do it, which essentially what you're going to do is you pay cash to buy the home, fix it up. And then you refinance, which is called a cash out refinance or you borrow private money from a lender. You know, other, another term of it is called hard money lending. So you get a hard money loan from somebody to cover your purchase in either all or most of your renovations. Now, Aaron, correct me here, or just confirm if I'm right here, but when, you, when somebody gets a hard money loan from a private lender, uh, for your company, is there a seasoning on that? Meaning if, if I close on the house today and I get a private lender from, from somebody, I can technically start the refinance with you tomorrow, correct? Correct. But. Correct. So how that would, go, go ahead with your butt. But let's say I used my own cash. I didn't have a private lender. And I bought the same house cash and I, and I fixed this house up. Because it's a cash out refinance, there is a seasoning criteria, correct? Yes and no. Okay, so we got a little bit of an interesting question here because it's a little bit loaded. Um, going back to the, let's just use numbers. Let's say it's a hundred, it's a fifty thousand dollar acquisition with twenty thousand in rehab, right? Sure. Puts us at seventy grand, correct? Let's mm -hmm. say that that's the deal. Let's say the after repair value is a hundred thousand, just for round numbers, right? And nobody can say that this is what the average deal is. Just we're just using numbers. So when we're talking about a a um, hard money deal and you use you borrow fifty thousand for the acquisition and twenty thousand for the rehab because your hard money lender knows it's gonna be worth a hundred thousand, you're essentially borrowing seventy thousand dollars. So you're gonna have a seventy thousand dollar lien against that property, a seventy thousand dollar note, and you're going to um, renovate it. We're going to start the process of your refinance immediately after you take possession. And then when you it is done, and I tell everybody when the when the the contractor is left They've cleaned everything up. They spit polished the whole place. They've mowed the lawn, made it ready for a photograph. That's when we want the appraiser to walk in there because appraisers, they appraise what they see. And if they see mess, they 
unfortunately a appraise mess. I mean, we're talking about people have to use their imaginations here. So just know appraisers' imagination suck. So we're going to give them the best opportunity to get the best uh, view of what that house is. Then once that appraisal is done, we do a refinance and we cannot exceed what the payoff of that loan is other than cost, right? So you can pay off that loan. Even though you have $100,000 in value, we're only giving you a $70,000 loan is what you're going to have, basically. And so it's paid off. You really in the deal for nothing, right? It's probably going to be a $75,000 loan to get costs and, and cover some interest, right? So you're in the deal for nothing. You now own the property. Now, on the flip side, if you pay cash, that person walks in the closing table, you give $50,000 to the title company, they close on that property, and then they're paying the contractor directly to rehab the property. Let's say they're done in a month and we've already started the loan. The max I can do within the first six months of ownership is to give them the cash back for what they paid for. So if they paid 50 grand and that's what it shows on my settlement statement, I can give them a $50,000 loan not to exceed 75% of the value. So we're talking about $100,000 value. Appraisal comes in at hundred grand, says that I can get them $75,000 in, in loan size. I should be able to get, they're like, wow, cool. I can go 75% loan to value. But since on paper, they paid 50, even though they put 20 into the rehab, I can only get them 50. So what we put them in a position then is then they have to decide, I've got to wait the full six months that season you just brought up. Then I can get cash out to get me my 75,000. They will nine times out of 10 elect to do that right at that point. But if we went back to the day they bought the property and if they signed a contract for 50,000, they had a contractor say they can rehab it for 20 and they took $70,000 to the title company and gave them 70,000. And on the title company's settlement statement, they had 50,000 for the purchase, $20,000 for the rehab costs, bottom line of 70,000. We then show that they took 70,000 to closing the property is now worth 100. I can go to 75. I can get them enough money back to where it reimburse them the full 70,000. They're again in the deal for nothing. So ultimately, it ends up the same place as it would with the hard money. Now, I tell everybody if you're considering a cash purchase on a property and you're considering this process at all, the only thing you got to remember from this, this, this conversation is make sure that Aaron Chapman or one of his team members like Ellen Schmidt or Carla Roush. See that estimated settlement statement, the one before you close. The title company is going to give it to you in an email. You're going to look at it and know how much money you have to wire in. Do not send a single dollar till we have looked at it and we said, yes, move forward. Because if that got messed up, your money's locked up for six months. And if some people, I have had them come to me after they've closed. Hey, I closed on this yesterday. Here's the paperwork. I'm like, sorry, we can't get that deal done. We'll get you the cash of the purchase price, but that's it. They said, well, I did what you said. I'm like, no, you didn't. Because I can honestly say you didn't do what I said because I didn't see this before you closed. I have to see it before you close. Otherwise, we, we, don't, we don't know how it's going to work out. Human memories are what they are. That's the only thing to remember. Be sure we see that estimated settlement statement before a single dollar leaves your hands to close on that property. Because the, one of the key things you're looking for is we want to make sure that the clients factor in that rehab that they send that money in and it's line itemized as rehab or renovation funds that's on there. And that's what allows them to get that back. Correct. Correct. That's what has worked for us. Now it doesn't mean they can't change the rules on it at any time, but right now it's working. And the other thing is, is we got to be sure they lined it out properly. Right. You know, title is basically holding that money in escrow for your contractor. Then they will cut a check to your contract after everybody's agreed the work is done. Make sure the work is done. Make sure you get an inspection. Make sure you verify everything is 100% complete because when they're paid, they're paid. The other thing it is, is we want to be sure how they're taking title. We've seen sometimes they go and buy the property in the name of their LLC. Well, their LLC happened to have their brother on it, the guy they were, that they were in the sandbox over there fighting in Afghanistan together, and they have now diluted the ownership of the asset. But they want to be the sole person on the loan. We can't do that. They have to take possession of it for six months at that point for us to get that deal done. So we have to be very cautious how it's done. We look at certain check marks, we go through it to, and ask questions to make sure it's right. So we can set them up for a successful transaction the best we can with the information we have available. We're not perfect, but we do our damnedest to be as close to perfect as we can, especially on that. Talk to me briefly about investor mindset. Uh, kind of along the terms, we've had this conversation before, uh, you know, how, how the investor's mindset looks at others as partners? So 
the what I've noticed when it first came into it, investors, the only experience they had when it comes to financing real estate was what they went through when they bought their house. And when you're buying your house, you're going through at the time of going through the newspaper or watching ads on TV. Now it's going on the internet and doing a search and you're trying to find what's the cheapest rates, right? And that's where people start. But the problem that we run into is now they're going into an environment where banks that, that don't like to work with investors because it's really not a market that, that the banking industry really likes. Um, they still believe it to be very risky because when you look at how that consideration of the equity scenario of the past and the appreciation really helped collapse the market. Well, now and the real successful investor changes their mindset from a consumer spending money and going into debt to now being a CEO of a real estate investment firm. Now, they look at themselves as now, I'm running this business, and their business is really the acquisition of cash flowing real estate assets, much like a little store, right? So they're buying the one asset. Then they're going to be working with yourself and your team out there in Memphis. So you're like the regional operations manager running business for them in Memphis, Tennessee. The acquisition, rehab, rental, and the maintenance of that property is all handled within one, one group, right? Well, on the flip side of that, I put myself up as not just the guy getting the loan done. I'm looking to be a trusted advisor at their board table, kind of like a fractional CFO, but not. Because they're going to face questions, decisions they've never faced before. And as we talked earlier, I'm doing 720 plus transactions a year. I get to see a lot of people's decision-making skills at work. There's an old saying, and I probably said in our last, last podcast, of good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. A person doesn't have to learn that way if they don't want to. I can take the judgment I have learned from watching other people decide and what the outcome was to give them practical data to make decisions with, just like you can on what it takes to get the rehab done. If they want to listen, it's up to them. They're the CEO, but they don't have to learn in the same way you learn on a grade school playground by just making a dumb decision and getting your butt kicked. We need to be sure that since the stakes are so high in this environment, we give them all the information we can from many years of experience, not just my experience either. Between you know, Ellen and many other people on my team, they got over 20 plus years of experience a person. Now, Ellen's been doing this since 1997, excuse me, 1985. I've been in since 97. She's been with me since 2011, I think. 2010, no, 2010, so nearly 10 years. Actually, it's 10 years. 10 years this year, we've been working together. So there's a ton of history here that we can use to help them make it bit, to have enough information to make the right decision. And, and like I said, a lot of investors probably won't look at it that way. They, they feel like they have to, and it's not a bad thing for them to be involved in every aspect of it, but uh, if they put the right team together, it can make their learning curve more manageable. Well, yeah, I tell everybody, like, have you ever heard the term, you know, the successful CEO say that the reason they're successful is because they recognize and embrace the fact that they're the dumbest person in the boardroom. If you hire people to sit at that board table that are dumber than you, and you got to tell them everything that you're to do, then you hired all the wrong people. You have to walk into a place where you're getting the best information from all the angles that they're involved in. And so I, I tell them, welcome to being the dumbest person in the boardroom and embrace it. You know, trust, you got to verify we know what we're doing, that we're not trying to hose you. But once you've got that, then you know you can just sit back, turn your back to us, let us get the job done, and you do what you do best, which is generating the revenue you've been generating, taking care of your family, and create that environment of capital to be able to continue to invest while we run your business. Now, it doesn't mean you don't check in. It doesn't mean you just let us go, but you definitely want to stay as involved as possible, but trust that we're going to get it done because you've got the experience that we have shown you that we get it done. Absolutely. Uh, now I got kind of a silly question for you. How often do you have people who will say things to you like, um, why, you know, the typical, why should I go with you over my friend who is a lender? I try to tell them, I don't know. I mean, you got to tell me why you would go with me over your your lender. In fact, a lot of times I'll ask, well, why aren't you already just on the phone with your friend who's the lender? Why would you even take Kurt's recommendation to even talk to me? What, what reason? Because apparently your friend is a badass and there are kick-ass lenders out there. Why would you even talk to us? Well, then they have to get right with that question. If you're, why would I even pick up the phone, right? And talk to anybody else but my friend. Then we get to have a real conversation at that point. 
And I, and I get to explain it, at least find out from them what is the most important part of this transaction to them. And secondly, lay the groundwork of the relationship. They're the CEO. They call the shots, but they got to know the history of what we do and understand my background, which I share in the same things I just shared today about 1997 and the mines and all that, and the, how many transactions. Then they get to decide. Then I also ask them, so what is everybody telling you you should be looking for? Is it rate? Is it term? And a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I want to pay it off as fast as I can and I want to get the best rate, but pay it off quickly. And that's when I said, do you mind if we take that thought process and sit on the shelf for a minute and let's explore something else? And if it makes sense, we at least give you something else to consider. You can always pick that back up. You can always decide, I'm going to go chase rate and whatever, and let's talk about it. We get to have a real detailed discussion about the economy, how compound interest is what they're trying to avoid. You know, that's what Einstein says, the eighth wonder of the world. But Einstein was not looking at compound interest from the eyes of a real estate investor in an inflationary environment. So we have an environment like we live in where the dollar is devaluing at a rapid rate every single year. You know what the, the, the published rate of inflation is? What? But the most recent published rate of inflation is 1.5%. Do you believe that? <laughs> it's pretty scary, actually. Well, what's scary is what it really is. Because if you go to shadow stats, as in shadow statistics, or the Chapwood Index, you'll find the national average is over 8%. So when I run my numbers, I just use a conservative number of 7 and so if the dollar is devaluing at a rate of 7% per year as far as its buying power, what's really interesting, it never goes to zero, but its buying power is losing 7% of its buying power to compound effect, that means when you recalculate the value of every dollar, when you make the payment back on that loan, we borrowed 80000 on a $100,000 purchase, to go back kind of the numbers we were talking about before, you bought a $100,000 property, you put 20% down, financed 80000 and you did it like at say you know, most recent rates are 4.75 and notice they've even gotten a little better than that. So if we did it at 4.75% over 30 years, you'd pay 71,000 in interest. Add those two together, that's $151,000 paid between principal and interest over 30 years. But when you recalculate every single dollar's value, every time you make a payment, payment compared to the day you used it to buy the asset, got that loan, you're not paying back the 80,000, you're not paying back the 71,000. You're paying back 62000 and change because the value, the instrument of what you're using is losing value. And because of this awesome thing called inflation, we get to raise rents as real estate investors. National average is 3.6%. 3 Let's say that $100,000 deal, you raise your rents by 3%. That means your $1,000 a month rent would go up by 30 bucks, right? Yes. Nothing sexy. 30 bucks doesn't get anybody out of bed. But if you're getting 200 in cash flow, which is pretty common, and it became 230, you now had a 15% compounding increase in your cash flow. Every time you raise it, let's say if you were lucky enough to do it every year, that's a compound 15% growth in your cash flow as you're paying a compound dec decline of 7% in the instrument you're using to repay it. That spread is creating hundreds of percent return. So when I get done with that conversation with most folks, I guarantee you they've never heard another lender talk about that because they don't. They say, well, here's my rates, here's my cost, we close on time. Well, if you don't do that crap, get the hell out of the business anyway. Because if you can't have a semi-decent rate and you don't close on time, why are you here, right? Now, when it comes to being able to dig deeper into the actual business of real estate investing, we have an absolute fiduciary duty to become better at what we do, more knowledgeable about what we do, and give them information to think through that they've never considered before. Because... You know, you and I have talked about before who made the most money during the uh, during the gold rush. People who sold the picks and shovels. Picks and shovels, right? That's us. They're looking at us right now, selling picks and shovels. That's what we're doing. The only difference is you and I are pointing them to where the gold is and explaining to them how to get it out. And we will be there to talk them through the process as often as we can. I have an assistant, Samantha, who schedules all my calls. They, all they need to do is call Samantha or reach out to her via email. Say, we need to schedule a, a, a meeting with Aaron, a board meeting, if you will. We'll talk about how do we extract the gold out of the ground. And eventually, they're not going to need a pick and a shovel. They're going to need a truck. They're going to need a traco. They're going to need a, uh, other mining equipment. They're going to need um, probably a, a, a mill and a smelter. And they're going to need a damn train. And when they need that train, guess who they're coming to for it? If you and I do our jobs and we fulfill our obligation to them to help them build their business, then we get to become wealthy as well, just like they do, because they need more than picks and shovels from us. They need equipment. They need all these things I just mentioned. 
And if we're able to provide that because we help them become, become you know, wealthy and secure, then we become that as a result. The problem that I've noticed in my industry is humans are the apex predator, right? There's no other, no other species preys on humans except other humans. And my damn industry and the real estate industry is full of predators. They can't wait to try and figure out a way to get the money from their pocket into theirs. Not realizing that if they ensure that person's pocket gets fuller, ours do it as a result. They don't get it. So the one thing I can, I can definitely say about my industry that I, that I love is the fact that it's full of predators because people will feel that eventually. And eventually they're going to find somebody who's not going to do that to them. And somebody says, why should we use you? I can't speak to your other guys, but I also know there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in my industry out there that cannot wait to get their hands in your pocket. That's not me. I can't wait to fill your pocket because if I do, mine just overflow. That's pretty damn deep if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, we're going to wrap this up here uh, real shortly here. Grab those books. Right on. All right. Now, for anybody who's still hanging with us here, Aaron himself has written four short books. Give us a quick little, pitch. little books, little books. Give us a so quick what it pitch. is. So the quick pitch is I was starting to write other books. I have a lot of pages written, but I discovered that most books out there and not most, there's a lot of great books, but there's a lot of books I've read. They could have gotten everything done in 10 to 15 pages. So I will not write anything beyond 30 pages. These are all like 25 average here. There's only 80 pages of content here, or excuse me, 88 pages. Eight's my lucky number from August 8th of 08, right? But eight's my lucky number between these four books, 88 pages of content. So we start off, point your head and heart, your ass will follow. That picture is right there is the cabin right next door to me here. That, that, that chair had changed my world. And I'll let you read the story, but it's all about this place here and how I got here. The next one we've got here, gratitude, a practical application. You got to check this out. Gratitude is not some sort of mystical force between us and God. It's not some mystical, you know, blessing pinata that's going to rain everything down on if you walk around with gratitude. There is an economy between people that you have to understand. I have two contrasting accounts from one week that tells you that directly. The, this one's the flagship book, actually, where I'm sitting right now. Quit jerking off. I actually shot this, this picture in my little preacher suit right here. Where, right in the backdrop right behind me. And then the final of them is Steel Running. This also is a lot about um, how, to, how to work your mind, uh, how, how powerful your mind is. It's why I wear the Steel Chainsaw hat for the last three years now. Actually, it's coming up on three years this month. Um, and I have a picture of me sitting in this chair for the very first time wearing this hat, right? So the reason that these don't have, you know, you can't even see that there's even any spines on here. You know, my publisher's like, oh, I'm not sure about the spine thing because you're not going to be able to put your title on it. I'm like, dude, it takes balls to go spineless. So we're going spineless. So I wanted to make sure a person can read this quickly. They can get the information quickly and they can put the damn thing in their pocket and hand it off to somebody else. So that's what we've got here. Love it, man. Now, uh, if we were summon this uh, talk up, what would you say final thought? What, what, what would your final thoughts be on our conversation for anyone who's still hanging with us? Well, if you're still hanging with us, one, thank you. And then two, final thought is quit jerking off. If you're thinking about it and you're sitting on this call right now, you haven't done anything to really move forward with your life, why not? The, the point of that, that book, you know, one, it also, it hits many different forms of the, of, the, of the words, but quit sitting there doing nothing. Move forward. Start getting something accomplished. The, the problem with all of our social structure right now is everybody's sitting in comfort. I have lived a life of constant state of discomfort. I need you people to start getting their ass up, start moving forward, because the only way that you're going to be able to grow is that way. You're not growing right here. And yeah, you're going to fall on your face. You're going to take a header in the concrete here and there, but that's life. That's how it works. That's how you learn. There's no good story about, or that is told about a guy sitting on a recliner, watching the game, eating Cheetos and falling asleep in it. That's not a story to tell on a campfire. You need to tell the stories about you trying and failing, but not failing, but just learning where not to go. You know, these books took me like four years to get to. And I had to go through all kinds of crap to get those written, but it was worth every cent. And you can go on Amazon and get them. You just look up the QJO initiative on Amazon, and that will bring up the four books. That means the Quit Jerking Off initiative. I'm put together an initiative to get people to quit it and stop wasting their freaking time. And every cent, just so you know, goes to charities. It does not go to Aaron Chapman. 
I'm not going to try and recover my cost to do the books. I'm going to further something else to benefit other people rather than me because I'm doing very, very, very well. And I pray that I continue to. That's why I'm not taking a dime from these. That's incredible. Now, in conclusion here, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, whether they want to talk about loans or your book or whatever, how can people, what's the best way that you want people to get in touch with you? Just go to my website, AaronBChapman.com, A-A-R-O-N, B as in boy, Chapman, C-H-A-P as in Paul, M-A-N.com. You'll see a redneck sitting on the porch and you're at the right spot. You're a hoot, man. Listen, I really appreciate your time. I know you're swamped there in the uh, cabin in Missouri, which I wish I was there right now, but I really appreciate your time to talk with me about this today because I think it's a lot of important stuff that real estate investors need to know, not just about loans, but uh, just changing their mindset on how to look at investing to, 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 to see the true benefit of what's really happening. Well, of course. And, you know, people will look at this, you know, turnkey thing with single family residences. Well, you know, I want to be, I want to have a skyscraper. You can't, you can't literally come out of learning how to walk and go into the Olympics. It doesn't work that way. You've got to slowly build up in the best way to start in a world like this. You get an awesome foundation with extremely great money. In fact, it's not debt. This is asset. When you're talking about 30 year fixed loan, it's the biggest asset of your business. Start there. Start following along with what we're talking about here. Get yourself educated. Call some good people and start your business. Man, words from the wise, Aaron Chapman. Appreciate it. Uh, for anyone, who's, like I said, who's still with us, if you like this interview, click the like button, share it with your friends, put it on your Facebook page, wherever. Subscribe to our channel. Get on over to realestatewealthcoaching.com. Sign up for your free training. If you're looking at buying property, call Aaron. He can certainly educate you, uh, not just on loans and lending, but hell, he'll even tell you what markets are performing well for investors, won't you, Aaron? And that I will, because I see where they're going. <laughs> you certainly are. All right, buddy. Well, listen, I appreciate it. And uh, for everyone who's watching, we'll see you guys on the next interview.